This episode was made possible thanks to generous supporters on Patreon. Hello everyone, my name is Alexandra Zerner and this is my YouTube series dedicated to your questions and my answers, which means that if you want your questions answered by me, write them down in the comments below. So now let's start with the first question. What have you been up to? Since I like so many artists, I'm going to ask your opinion of my favorite since I've been 12. The original Alice Cooper group. I like his solo stuff a lot also, but the old guard started it all for me. To be honest, I didn't even know how this group actually sounds like and I needed to check out some of these things so I can gain my uh, impression of it. And uh, I can't really say that this is my type of music, and but it's a definitely interesting type of rock. It's a little bit more progressive, let's say, uh, compared to the regular uh, rock uh, which appears in this um, 60s and 70s. So yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting from that point of view. We all know you as an outstanding musician, but you're also an experienced producer and sound technician. So I guess my question is if you could talk us through the technical side of producing an album from idea to finished product, the hardware and software involved, organizing the material, how to make the various instruments work well together and not get in each other's way, etc. I've addressed a little bit of this in the previous video, but today I will try to elaborate additionally on that. That's true that uh, I'm also a music producer, but this is part of the job since I'm a composer and session musician and being such, this just requires uh, one to possess uh, music production skills as well. My number one principle is uh, garbage in, garbage out. And this is extremely important uh, because if you have a good input signal and generally uh, production on the input, uh, then you guarantee that your results won't be bad. And I see that many people just uh, neglect this part of the production process and they just record the, the parts uh, somehow and they, they think that everything will be fixed on the post-production, but I mean, this is not magic. Post-production is uh, just polishing things and arranging them, but uh, if at the input you don't have a good source, nothing can really help you. In addition to that, I've always uh, had a very minimal setup, not only because of this principle, but also for budget reasons. I've always uh, tried to maximize the use of everything that I have and to use it optimally so I can have the best results as possible. These things have been always the most important for me. Essentially what I use is um, guitar floor processor or uh, my tube preamps and this is everything that I have for the guitar on the input. I try to make the sound as good as possible so I don't do any corrections afterwards. Just like I said, it's the garbage in, garbage out principle and I apply this to absolutely everything and I try to uh, make the entire mix to sound well together right from the start and I make sure that even if I don't touch anything, even the recording itself in its original form will sound good. I think this is the correct approach and actually this is how it's been done right from the start before all the technology advances so much that allows to uh, do so much editing and studio magic but at the beginning it's been just a band 
and they just play together in a studio it's recorded and even before that it's even aired on the radio like that so it needs to be perfect right from the start from the performance uh, point speaking of gear as i said i'm using just very minimal stuff for the guitar for the acoustic instruments i just use one microphone and I found the way I like these instruments to sound, so I always record them the same way. So it's kind of safe bet. Regarding the keyboards, I've got uh, a huge MIDI keyboard, which is a uh, hammer keyboard. I use plugins and sample libraries. It's kind of simple solution. The drums in my first albums, I used plugins as well. In my last album, the drums are actually live drums recorded. What I do in regards of the well sounding composition at the end, it's another principle that I follow uh, very strictly. And this is that the good mix starts from the composition. If you pay enough attention to the instrument parts, how uh, they are written, what kind of space they take, and what kind of complexity, what kind of range, you, you take the time to study all of this and uh, figure out what type of parts uh, interact with other parts of instruments uh, this will give you a lot of insight how to build the song right from the start one very important thing is that if an instrument sounds very well alone it doesn't mean that it will sound well in the mix and uh, of course an instrument that sounds good in the mix might have quite a crappy sound if it's isolated so this is something to consider um, when making the sound right from the start because you know especially for guitar players it's very problematic because uh, it's quite often you make a huge uh, stadium type of uh, sound you enjoy it very much and then you put it into the band and it's either all guitar and everything else can't break through or the guitar falls somewhere into the mud and can't break through and basically this problem starts precisely because of this uh, very cool sound when you play alone. And the other principle is something that uh, Bob Katz has said uh, that uh, mixing is uh, art of compromise and I think uh, it's the same for composition because as I said the good mix starts from the composition and if you learn to make the compromise on that level then your mix will be much better because you don't have to make heavy choices what to cut out and in order to tolerate something else and finally it becomes even psychologically unpleasant because it's like sacrificing something for the sake of something else. Generally, I try to not to put too many complex parts at the same time and just to have one that sticks out and everything else is more or less a support of this. And these grants that uh, I won't have mix problems later. Also I've learned through the years that uh, often I just need to uh, to minimize the stuff and not uh, insist of putting so many things uh, there. In the past uh, I fell into this trap of uh, having a certain part of the song and there I, I have like a, great bass line, I've got great uh, rhythm guitar line, I've got great keyboards, great solo and when you put them all together and it becomes a mess. This corresponds again to this idea of uh, having compromise. If I really want to have all of these figures I just make the, the part longer or I just do reprises and I put one part in the first uh, appearance of the, the section then another 
instrument part that I want to stick out, I put it into the next repetition and so forth. And in such a way, I managed to have all of my musical babies without uh, just covering them all by itself and making it impossible for them to stick out. Regarding the software, um, I'm using Logic Pro for so many years that I don't even remember. I just remember it was uh, version 6 or 7 when I started using it or something like that, so it's been a very long time. I find this uh, particular DAW very composer friendly and um, this is why I use it and uh, I don't plan to change it. Of course I use a lot of plugins, predominantly sample libraries, because they of course um, make it possible to have all kinds of instruments that I want to use in my music. Of course uh, it's always a problem how to keep a project organized because at certain point it becomes way too heavy and you can't actually work. I had this problem for example with Silhouette, my computer just literally stopped working and um, I uh, try to minimize the tracks as much as possible and I used a lot of automation just to turn on and turn off different instruments so uh, it could be playable at all. When I record uh, instruments, uh, usually I do some pre-mixes so I, I can ensure that they won't be artifacts or the project during the recording process won't be too heavy. Of course, this slows down a little bit the production time, but uh, you guarantee that you won't have unexpected problems and uh, things to be done twice because of uh, recording issues. Organizing the project is also something that needs to be uh, thought through in advance, just like with the composition. So you need to, to think well how to record something, how many uh, tracks it would possibly take so you can think how to arrange this in a um, optimal way so you don't torture your computer too much unless of course you have like some very powerful computer which I don't <laughs> so I always need to think about these things of course naming tracks properly right from the start and organizing them uh, right from the start color coding and markers and everything, this saves just a huge amount of uh, time and nerves. I've been working with uh, many people who are so chaotic and at certain point uh, the project becomes too big and they can't find anything and it's just uh, all the time scrolling back and forth, muting and muting and nobody has uh, even the slightest idea where certain thing is. It's, it's impossible to work efficiently like that and this is why I always do all the arrangement of the project right from the start so this saves a lot of nerves and time. Regarding the arrangement of the instruments Mm, I think it's uh, more or less a question of experience since uh, there are certain things that are like valid for pretty much everything and uh, the certain instrument shouldn't cover too much the, the range of the neighboring instruments and when you have uh, an important part in certain part of the spectrum you shouldn't put other instruments playing very actively in the same within the same range because it will just mask the stuff and essentially this is the basic principle you need to leave a frequency space for everything and i think this is um, the basic principle one should follow when they compose stuff Quite often with the keyboards essentially, especially, it's a huge problem because uh, they are very broadband. Usually people tend to play in some range which covers uh, the guitar parts or the voice, so uh, usually right in the middle of the 
spectrum it becomes a huge mess and you need to be very careful which goes a little bit lower something might go a little bit higher just to free some space you can use different um, different inversions of the chords just to, to make these tr tricks work somehow and essentially it's all about putting things into the spectrum properly so they don't overlap each other and essentially this is the secret. Another thing is of course you can do the same thing with panning, this also helps a lot because sometimes some things just appear in within the same range and there is nothing you can do so panning is uh, another thing that I use. Hi AZ, hope you're on demand. I'm interested in your thoughts regarding an organized strategy using the cage system for extended chords beyond sevenths. What notes to throw out and when is something I struggle with. Good related book recommendations. Cheers, Chris. Hi Chris and thank you for your question. Um, I'm afraid that the cage system is uh, not something that will help you in this particular case because it's designed as a very simple solution to uh, learn the basic chords quite quickly and to find your way around. Once you go into very complex chords like 9s, 11s, 13s, you just need to learn how to build them and uh, as you said, uh, this, this is always a problem um, which notes you can omit and essentially how to build the court and I will actually make uh, make a video about that so uh, I will elaborate on the topic for the sake of uh, clarity and just not to make it chaotic and difficult to find I prefer to make this in Dr. Zerner episode instead of answering here the idea is just uh, to understand how to build courts uh, as much as possible and this will help you to understand how to solve uh, all these problems with the more complex chords. Regarding literature, I can't really recommend anything specific because uh, I've been developing my theoretical knowledge uh, predominantly on my own because I I do not fully agree with some things that have been written here and there and I try to, to synthesize the theory in a different way so it can be more understandable and um, that's why I can't really recommend certain books related to that. Dear Alexandra, I'm asking to myself and to you why not to use your vibrato a little more as for example Jeff Beck or Scott Henderson. Maybe your compositions do not need that. I think it could be very interesting as I am sure you are able to do it. My second question concerns the scalloped frets. I'm interested to see the movement of the finger by zooming with the camera. It is to see the difference with not scalloped and what possibilities it gives more. Thank you very much for all your work. It gives more light to life. So regarding your first question, I actually use the tremolo quite a lot. Probably not um, in the same way as Jeff Beck. Uh, but one good example is a uh, section of my track Conjunctio, uh, where there is this theme. And here, for example, and this is where I do this type of thing. And again, probably this sounds uh, like a regular band and uh, this is why you probably get the impression that I don't do it at all, but I actually do. 
uh, probably it's just not as much as um, the aforementioned names. As uh, Steve Vai said in one of his videos that uh, he thinks that uh, Womi Bar should be rather called Expression Bar, uh, I agree on this statement because this is something that gives uh, just uh, one more articulation and uh, if you need this type of articulation you just use it and uh, whenever I need this particular type of sound of course I do it of course I'm not a uh, tremolo abuser like Steve Vai <laughs> but uh, I use a lot of a lot of vibrato and this uh, type of this type of things uh, just they're probably not so uh, expressive just like Steve Vai does for example and regarding the scalloping um, I took the time to investigate my movements and I can't really say that I see any difference. Unfortunately, uh, since I'm shooting all this on my own and if I just come very close to the camera, it will be out of focus. So um, I will try to demonstrate it like that. Essentially, if I make a vibrato here, this is how it looks like. And uh, if I make the same type of vibrato on a regular fretboard, it looks pretty much the same. The thing is that on a regular fretboard, I feel that my uh, finger is touching so much wood that it kind of bothers me and it feels like it's obstructing my movement. This is the main reason why I prefer having scalp thread because it gives me more freedom of the movement. Additionally, there is this thing that when you have a very complex chords, like for example this C major, and here the second finger is pressing on a very uh, awkward angle and if the fretboard is not scalloped, the fingernail actually touches the wood and it could lead to something that I call non pressato. This thing, when you're actually not pressing enough and the sound kind of sucks. These are the two benefits I personally find from having scalloped fretboard. Just so when I don't have wood, it gives me more freedom to, to move uh, around and especially since the vibrato is a very uh, expressive movement it's uh, where you can feel this limitation the most when it's, uh, it's not scalloped. So I hope that this answers your question. So that's everything for this episode and I hope you like it. Thanks for watching and if you want your questions answered by me, write them down in the comments below. And if you like what I do, consider supporting me on Patreon on the links down in the description where you can get access to all kinds of interesting things like tabs, audio downloads, exclusive materials and the membership starts as low as $3 per month. And now you can also support the channel by uh, the YouTube membership by clicking the join button down there below and by becoming a member you can also get access to all kinds of interesting perks. And if you wish to support me by a single donation you can use the PayPal me link below. If you're a first time viewer, please subscribe to my channel and click that bell notification button to get informed when I upload new video. See you next time and progon!